Okay, so pray for me now. Father, thank you. Loose him, impale him, and propel him for your glory. Amen. Well, welcome to the flight deck, everybody. That's been a wild time. Um, Hua. Okay. I'm not sure where this is going. Um, those of you who are here a lot, you know that we, I work really hard to try to track with what is God saying in time, right? There's the, the verse you all know in Proverbs that a word rightly spoken, aptly spoken is sometimes a translation, right? Is like a setting, uh, like an apple of gold in a setting of silver. The, world, the word aptly actually comes from a wheel that moves. So in other words, different parts of a wheel contact the ground at different points. And the right part of the wheel's got a contact, obviously, for it to roll. And so that timing of things, so I always try to seek out and go, God, what are you saying now? Because we could get up here and talk about anything in here, right? And it would be of value to someone, or to all of you. But to try to align what God's saying to the church now is always my passion, right? So we're just about, we're coming up to the end of God's biblical 11th month. Okay, which is linked to the 11th tribe, Asher. We've talked about that. It tends to be a lot of chaos stuff and some craziness. Okay, any of you experiencing any of that? Okay, but we're about to cross over on uh, Monday night. We, we move into the 12th month, the first of Adar. Okay, and 12 is a very different biblical number. I'm going to cover more of that next week. We'll do first fruits. And I was torn. Are we supposed to go there yet? And I couldn't get peace that we were to do that yet. We're still in 11. And then I've been going through some real rough stuff. And this morning, God just, I was sitting waiting before him going, okay, what do you want to talk about then? <laughs> Here we're going. And he just started giving me this, every time I get something that would emotionally churn, do you know that when you're with the Lord and suddenly your brain goes, <laughs> and you start, <laughs> every time any of that comes, I go, no, no, just asked it, no, 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 just, I had to dismiss it. I, and I kept having to clear this space, literally, like in front of me. And what I began to see is that actually I was on some land and it was covered with fairly new pine straw. And God helped me, kept having me with each one of these, pulling back the pine straw so there was nothing but dirt underneath. Okay, you got that picture? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, but it wasn't like moist dirt. It didn't look that rich. It, it was kind of dry and dusty. And I'm down on my hands and knees and I'm pushing this pine straw away. And I'm just kind of like, God, what? And every time something else would come down, I go, no, 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 we've got to clear it away. There was nothing that it was grown on there. It was clean. There was, there was something new. But I kept going, okay, God, what, what is this about? What are you saying? What? And, and I kept feeling like tonight I had to keep, well, you know, you guys know me, right, who've been here. I can, I, can, I can give so many images to you in Scripture. You're just going out like, Ugh. someone said one time, it's kind of like going to the buffet, all-you-can-eat buffet. And there's so many things. You're kind of not sure what to, okay. And, and I just had to kind of keep pushing back, going, okay, I don't really know where it's going. I have to loose it. I have to loose it. And I found, though, that I was, I was kneeling down and sort of weeping over the dirt because I had a sense that the dirt was tired. You know? That in the seventh year, we're supposed to let the land rest. And it's just that there was a weariness. And so the song we sang tonight about Thrive, starts out with a lyric about in that that dry what is it weary worn and weary land where many a dream has died i wasn't originally planning to do that song but the picture of that and the way that reflected some things in me was so strong that i just i had to stay there so but i always want to try to be encouraging to you all so i, I want to speak life in the midst of that but i want to let you know that some of you some of us have soil that we need to let rest you get? There's certain areas that you've been producing, 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 and God's just like, it's okay now to rest it. But God, I gotta, I gotta get this crop and this. It's okay, right? You receive that? Amen. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit a couple things here, and I jumped ahead of that. But this slide was from last week. A number, of, good number of you were here, right, when I introed this, and then we had the mayor. Mayor Gail Kahn. I, I love having him here. Yeah. I mean, he's just, he's, his heart is to serve. 
and and to hear things of concern and praise and to move in that um, and so we just try to be here for him this is not about anything asking any tough questions it's about being present for him and aligning in prayer um, this morning um, I got an invite to come back again to opening open the council meeting with prayer on Thursday which is always an honor right I, I mentioned that um, so I want to I want to just tee this up I'll send up an email later but last time I went up there the first thing I had to do before I prayed is repent in front of all the council members for not praying for them more and saying, you know, we put you up here, we elected you, and then we just sort of leave you hanging. And that's really wrong. And so I, I repented on behalf of myself and the church for that. But what I'm wondering is, is if there'll be a group of you who'd be willing to be down there be, a little before 5.30. Because what I'd like to do when I go up front is have you all stand and say, I need you to understand that I'm not praying this alone. And that you have allies in this town that are praying for you. And these are just a handful from different places. So be thinking about that if that's something that God would have you do. I may even give names out. I may ask for you know, at least two people per council person just to commit to pray and to tell them that. Every one of you here has two people that are going to be praying for you every day for the next 30 days. It's just a commitment because we can't just throw you out here. Okay? But what get would... What John does every time he comes is he helps shift our perspective. And I sent this out in a follow-up email, but I, I just felt like I want to come back to it because this was the slide that I used to talk about all the different perspectives, right? And even though we think that you are not some helpless sheep, but you are dangerous and armed, right? Either for good or evil. You constantly make that choice in your words, in your thoughts, how you move, how you act. You are loosing things in agreement with the kingdom of light or with darkness, right? And if you think you're all one or the other, let me just tell you, very few are, right? Just look at Peter, right? One minute, you're the Christ, the Messiah. The next thing, you can't go to Jerusalem and be killed. So, okay, we get that. But So the perspective is important that we have it shifted. But I sent this out and said, do you understand what those lines are? Do you know what those lines are in the cockpit? Yes, sir. What is it? That's right. It's detonation cord. It's actually explosive cord right over their head because that glass at certain places can be over a half inch thick. And see, if that protection isn't shattered, the pilot is trapped inside. And so the word that I released, and I just want to say it to you again, if you don't let God shift your perspective and your vision, He will blow it up. Do you understand? You have to, we, we're constantly letting God alter and shift our perspective of things because we get locked into an old pattern. We get the tunnel vision. And God is saying, I need you to shift to a new way. I can't see Mike or perceive or presume he's the same man that I saw a few days ago. He's changed. And if I lock him into that, I'm not trying to see the new glory God's releasing on him. And i got to call that up. Okay? Does that sort of make sense? Okay, well, just, just take that. Say, Lord, okay, change, let your perspective be changed or God will implode it. Okay? That's just one of those things. So, here was this, I just, this is the closest picture I could get to my picture. All right? It was the dirt with a little bit of a caution ribbon over it. And, and I want to just touch on this because this is kind of where I've been feeling is a little bit out of Elijah, on fire or burnt out. Do you get what I mean by that? Okay, so let me just let me just read you a little bit here. We're not I'm not actually going to take that long tonight cuz surprise. You know the story right though where Elijah is is on Mount Carmel, right? Showdown at the OK Corral. How many prophets does he face off? 450 prophets of Baal, right? Nose to nose. And if you haven't read that recently in 1 Kings, you need to go back and read it, right? Because he taunts them. They're at there and they're at it and everything else. Because he says, okay, Israel, how long are you going to go between two opinions? Get all of Israel here. So there he is in 450 people, right? And I've shown you slides before to show one versus 450, just to get an idea of how outnumbered you are, right? And then he lets them go two altars, right? And he lets them go at it. And then he taunts them. Well, maybe your God's on the bathroom. He actually says that. Covered his feet is the euphemism, but that means, you know, he just, or he's taking a nap, right? And then he builds the altar again with 12 stones, one for each of the tribes of Israel. 
right? Cuts it all up and then does what? Water. water on it. And this is in the middle of what? What's going on? In a drought. So he takes one of the most precious commodities and does it three times, soaked. <laughs> and then says, okay, God, showtime. Right? Yep. Okay. And what happens? <laughs> right? On fire. Yeah. <laughs> right? And then he says, grab the prophets of Baal. And who kills them? He does. He does. So is he, okay, is he rocking? Is he on fire? Okay. And not only that, but then he, then he goes and he, he crouches down to pray, right? And what's he praying for? Rain. Rain, right? And he sends his servant out. Go out. You see anything? No, there's nothing. Go back. Go back, right? How many times has he got to go back? Seven times, right? He says, there's a cloud like a, like a man's hand. Just a little bit of hope. He goes, that's it. I got it. So he goes and tells the king, you need to go run. You need to ride or you're going to get caught in a storm, right? So the king rides off. Elijah, full of faith, right? It says he actually outruns the king. Okay? On fire? Okay. So, how does that reflect for you? Some of you have been that way? Okay. So that's all good. He ran ahead of Ahab on the way to Jezreel. I don't normally just read this to you. I usually have it on slides, but here you go. So, Elijah. Now, Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. So, man of fire, having faced down 450, having prayed and seen rain come, having outrun the chariot, now, verse 3, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. So it goes from on fire to a burnout real fast. And then he does when all, what all of us do when we're in this state. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. Right? He becomes increasingly isolated. While he um, himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. Yeah. <laughs> I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Now, this is where I really get this. Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. <laughs> this is depression 101. This is burnout. Any of you gone through this? Any of you struggling with it now? You notice I still have my hand up. <laughs> and these two laugh at it. Okay. It's really funny you're struggling with it. Okay, so let me keep reading. I, I love this because meanwhile, he is not alone even though he thinks so. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. I love this. There is no do not be afraid or anything. It's just, hey, you, sleepyhead, pity party man, get up, eat. So, okay, brief to the point. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals in a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid down again. Which means he fell asleep, right? Okay. Don't you love the word? Because it's just like, it's so real. That's all I could do. I got up, I slept, I, I went back to bed again. Except for the angel part. That might scare the snot out of me, but I, you know, for him, it's just no big deal. So the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him. And again, these profound words, get up and eat, Okay. <laughs> Don't you love it when God, okay, one of my favorite lines of Jesus is to the disciples after they've freaked out and they've been fishing. He says, come and have breakfast. Is this just this real, you think he'd have something more profound to say, but for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb. Okay, so he's, he's got some, that was more than a five hour energy drink. And he went to the mountain of God and there he went into the cave and spent the night. Okay, so here we go into this part. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> so, and Elijah's reply. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. 
I am the only one left. <laughs> and now they're trying to kill me too. <laughs> no, okay. Are we reading? Are we reading each other's mail? Okay. <laughs> Once these two get going, it's hard to, you know, you know. But you have to understand there can be no religious spirit in here, right? You have to get how the angels laugh at a lot of what goes down with us, I think. So The Lord said to him, Go and stand out on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. So after all that, after giving great glory, standing in and then just collapsing under fear, he runs, he isolates, he sleeps, he eats, he sleeps, he eats, he runs, he gripes to God, and God just says, Okay, it, it's time to set this straight and I but I need you to stand on the mountain now back here in the cave out there then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord but the Lord was not in the wind after wind there was an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake after the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. Right, I'm pausing a little bit because we just read through this rather than wind, okay, and he's got to recover from that. An earthquake and then, you know, and he's waiting for the presence. He's waiting, right? Because God said, my presence is going to go. And so he's waiting, he's looking, and it's like suddenly, it's, okay. And God does things to shift us and to shake us in the midst of that because he's recalibrating. He's taking that view and shattering it. You thought you saw clearly. Well, guess what? Boom, I'm going to blow the snot out of that. And I have to get your attention. So sometimes I've got to take the very ground that you're on and shake it. I've got to take what you're on. I've got to blow by you. And you keep looking for me, but I'm not ready to show up yet because I still don't have your full, complete, and undivided attention. And then a fire comes. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. Right? Are you, you, you grasping this, right? And then I love this. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. It's very interesting because we don't know what the whisper said. It had to be very personal. It might have even been the same line. What are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> right? Okay. Because he's reminding him again from the fire and everything that went down on Mount Carmel. Okay, you think that was something? Let me just shake the ground around you. So he goes out. Then the voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Right? I mean, I realize I'm trying to give some interpretation. But I think his attitude's clear at the first time, and even though he's using the same words, it's shifted. And the Lord said to him, go back to where the way you came to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel um, Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Haziel. And Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. I love the word because a lot of times, right, all I want to do is just read it to you guys and shut up. Because there's just, right, so much there. So in the midst of, of feeling like we're alone, we're not. 
But let me just let me just give you some personal disclosure here, okay? Because this is something I've been trying to articulate. And if you come here a lot, you get to know my heart. I love the bride, okay? I love the bride of Christ. I love the body of Jesus, and I think she's amazing, and I think she is dynamic, and I think she is meant to be stunning, and she is meant to be victorious, and she is meant to be bold, and discerning, and, and sensitive, and smart, and powerful, and humble, and gracious, and good. But what happens, the bride is just like any one of us, we come in agreement with other stuff. And what happens is when we gather to be the bride, then often the stuff that we bring gets multiplied. My wounds and damage, the denial I still move in, the legalism, stuff like that, right? We get together and suddenly it starts playing with each other. That stuff in me starts to pull it up out of Phil or out of Jackie and suddenly we get together and there's a whole atmosphere begins to charge and so a lot of times the bride starts looking perplexed right or she just gets plain old nasty sometimes and I have a lot to say because um, God has put a prophetic thing in me right and the problem with a prophet prophetic anointing is that you see things and and they burn in you and I have a thing about injustice in me I have a thing about bullies and when I see the bride begin to act like a bully and it's not even her so we understand right let me show you this one verse out of from Paul from Romans 7 I do not understand what I do for what I want to do I do not do but what I hate I do as it is, it is no longer I myself doing it, but it is sin living in me. Yeah. Right? You get that. Paul is saying there's a dynamic that operates in me at times, and it's coming in agreement with this foul stuff of the enemy, with the lies of the enemy, with the spirits of the enemy. I come in agreement with that, and suddenly the very things I don't want to do, I'm doing. I want to put to you, I think the body of Jesus does that a lot. The institutional church, we end up doing that. I think in our heart, very well motivated, but as a result, awful things tend to happen and there's just a high level of bondage and there's a level that the bride that was to develop into the gloriousness has been arrested and so my struggle at times is that I can be embarrassed about those manifestations of church do you understand I love the bride but I get embarrassed often by how she dresses and how she acts. Yeah. Okay? Because we can go from any extreme to being dressed like a hussy, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to become all politically correct or being just hard <laughs> as nails. <coughs> Standing there with the jail keys. Right? And people are like, wow, you know, one, there's no distinction at all from culture. The other one, it's like there's nothing that draws me there at all. And my struggle is here is that we're, we want more for the bride. But a lot of times, let me ask this, if John the Baptist showed up in the back door of the sanctuary where you go on Sunday, how welcome would he be? If Elijah did. How about Jesus? I've been looking at some of the things on the anger of Jesus. I didn't bring it in here, but it says, and Jesus looked around them in anger because of their hardness of heart. Yes. Because, again, they took part of the word about resting on the Sabbath, and they came in agreement with how that walks out that Jesus couldn't heal somebody. And so they got in, in love, in bondage, and in a uniform, and Jesus had to speak against it because the bride was in bondage, right? And he came to set her free. Are we tracking? My challenge is that I'm feeling kind of exasperated over what I, versus what I thought was going to happen. And um, I, I, let me get to that in a second. Let me just let me go a couple quick things here. Arrested <laughs> development. 
this word, was it Nikki? Shannon. 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 We had, you know, we have a strategic prayer team that meets about <coughs> some issues in Lowndes and, and other things. We won't go into all that now. But part of that is spending time sitting and listening to the Lord about what's next and how do we go. And this word came up about arrested development. You know what that is? So let's just look. Because this is often what happens. To arrest is to seize someone by legal authority and take him into custody. To stop or check. You get that, right? Development. The act or process of growing or causing something to grow or become larger or more advanced. Do you see the bride is supposed to grow or become more advanced? All we really want to do here is help you guys move in more so that the body, so that the bride moves in more gets out of the straitjacket, understands that she's got all the weapons of warfare by the Holy Spirit, understand that there is a war going on, that she's no longer in Kansas. It's not Mayberry anymore. That the church has to engage fully in all things. We want them to understand that they are connected in one new man, Jew and Gentile. We want to understand all the gifting in the body, male and female. We just want freedom. There's so much that's got to get called out. And it's been arrested development. The act or process of creating something over a period of time and the state of being created or made more advanced. So all these things are supposed to be happening. And I just, I feel like I have a huge mandate to try to help the body do that. And yet I feel like it's only going so far. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And so my challenge, I'll be very candid with you, is that there's been a lot of hope deferred, hope deferred, hope deferred, hope deferred. And my barren soil there that God's been confronting me with is that I have allowed my mission to become a God. Do you understand? Yes. I've seen whether I have greater impact on the world as being the measure of my value and worth rather than just solely who I am in Jesus. Do you get? Yeah. So, I'm going to jump down to an end part here. I'm going to come back to it. Well, let's go back here. I guess I want to bring this up. I have this picture in this thing. A farmer went out to sow his seed as he was scattering some seed. Some fell on the path it was trampled on. The birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground. When it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. Right there, the issue, he led me to the issue of the soil and the soil having to rest. And it just connected me in with this. The seed is the word. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so they may not believe and be saved. I want you to know that Jesus is talking right now about the seeds just in terms of salvation. But do you think there's another application to it? Like your life and your walk and your vision and the ministry that God has given you and the assignment. I want to tell you, a lot of us have been given assignments. I don't know what in terms of prophetic art anointing got released tonight and how that will help you advance. But sometimes in the midst of that, it's very easy that it gets along the path. Some of you will have things released tonight. It's not salvation, but it was healing and the enemy will kind of snatch that out as soon as you get up. He's trying to do it already. Yeah. Then next, those on the rocky ground, the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in time of testing, they fall away. Right? This work right here was given a model of an aircraft carrier. And that word now has literally gone around the world, right? There's a videotape of that now that I'm still getting emails from people just last week with somebody in Australia or New Zealand, right? It's, it's impacting out there, but it's still like, but God, it's, it's not enough. It's just a parable, a way of understanding that everyone here is armed and dangerous. And the church can't just be a building with stupid sheep coming and going. It needs to be more of a mobile platform where people come and get what they need, including encouragement, support, family relationship, healing, new revelation, but then they're sent back out because that's where the action has to happen. The seed's got to go out further. But it's hard because 
There were times when we thought it was going to really ignite, and it didn't happen. And so I sit there going, okay, God, what now? The seed that fell among the thorns stand for those who hear it, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. You've heard this, right? But the seed on the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by what? It's a really important word. So let me just show you a couple things here in the Greek. That word means to strangle completely, literally to drown. This is the weeds word. So here's the question. Is there hope? Is there a vision? Is there a word from the Lord that's being drowned? Okay? Being choked off. The things that come against that, the first word means to be drawn in different directions. In other words, you're just distracted. That's the first thing that will choke, is just pure distraction. Second, is from the base of wealth, literally money, possession, and riches, right? For wanting that, we won't do that. And then, this is uh, hedone, from Tbilisi, you know, hedonism, right? Comes from that word. Just for pleasure, just my desire. Well, I, did, I didn't feel like doing it, right? <coughs> Talking with Kim, how many of you ever saw the thing about faith, fact, and feeling? It was a choo-choo train. When I first came to Jesus in middle school, they showed me a diagram. And the engine was faith, and the coal car was fact, and the caboose was feelings. And they said, you need to be sure what leads. You can't go by your feelings, it's the caboose. They follow. But we tend to get discouraged and just... And then your bios literally means your present state of existence. So these things come and choke out, those things of life. And if not, they won't bring it to perfection. So, this is six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its crop. But during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a rest to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard, your harvest after growth you shall not reap, and your grapes of untrimmed vines you shall not gather. The land shall have a sabbatical year. So I guess part of what you have to discern, and I have to discern in the midst of that, if you, and if you have a field like that, that I described? Maybe not. Have to discern what's going on and what needs to be done. This is a really important verse out of Song of Solomon. This is the bride speaking. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Part of the challenge here is we actually pour into a lot of other people and a lot of other ministries. And that's part of what we're supposed to do is equip and train them. But sometimes we just get weary. I get weary. Because sometimes it's literally years and hundreds of hours, and then those people go on and do great things out there. Okay. Part of that has to happen. But sometimes it's just it's going out one way, and I have to figure out the balance in the midst of that. Wow, how was that for some lightweight word? What are you hearing out of this? What are you getting out of this? Is any of it speaking to you? I've just I've had to sweep this area open. And I've had to be this candid with you about my own struggle right now. How is this speaking to you? Does it have relevance for you? We're right in this transition now from going to 11 to 12. 12 goes into divine governmental authority. That triggers over. We'll talk about, we'll do first fruits next Thursday, okay? And celebrate what's happening. And it's linked to the tribe of Naphtali. And that's hugely important because the person for me that is best known in that is Barak, who is linked with Deborah. And the prophetic word is there through Deborah, but Barak, who's got control of the people, has to make a decision whether to believe or not, to go or not. Do you understand? Part of the challenge we have here is we move in the prophetic word and we're trying to release that to a lot of places, but a lot of places go, nah. Sorry, not going to war with that. And we'll cover that because then Deborah goes into a song, right? Some tribes gain, some tribes don't. 
But then there's actually a specific curse loosed in there over one group who were in the middle of it and deliberately chose to turn away. So we're in a time, prophetic word going, my, what I would ask for just personally for your prayers is to sustain and refresh my relationship with the three. You know, I enjoy Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. Part of what we want to restore to the bride is I've seen too many manifestations of the bride. Churches, let's call them, are specialists. It's like going to a doctor now. They all have their focus. Oh, well, we don't do that. Some just do this, and every Sunday there's always an altar call, right? And that's and they're very and that's good. But there's nothing much. There's not a whole lot else. Others never have one. Others, it's all about you know uh, a, a dynamic of worship. But there's nothing about how you're pressing in the community. A lot of it can be a lot of uncomfort, and there's not enough challenge there. Others can just be angry all the time. It's like, gosh, do I need to be yelled at? <laughs> I'm tired of getting yelled at. I'm willing to be talked to. And even talk that and, and, you know, confront it on stuff. But don't, you don't have to yell at me. Right? But a lot of specialists. And the thing is, we just want, we want the bride to have it all. We want her to have it all. There's richness. That's why we keep teaching you stuff that's coming out of the Old Testament. Because, again, if you're like me, I didn't get, I didn't know it was all there. Wow. This is my inheritance. How cool is that? I've been grafted into that. But in the midst of that, and attending to often others' vineyards, and um, I've got to be balanced. I have to be discerning and submitting enough under the three. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They, three persons, one God. Okay? Next week, first fruits. Twelfth month. Month of Naphtali. I'll send out a ping to give you some scriptures to look at. And it just, it's again, it's just things that I think God has set in time to remind us of who we are and all that we have access to. Let me just say too, everyone here has had times when you felt like Elijah under the broom tree. Okay. So let God meet you in that. Let's not be a body where we can't talk or be real about those times. That's one of the the, the clothed outfit that the body will sometimes wear and there's just too much posing and too much everything it's whatever and it's like come on I need I, I want a bride a woman who is accessible and real and has that strength but that compassion right doesn't make me feel stupid if I'm doing something that is stupid but rather looks at me and can kind of smile and, and give me kind of a you know and hit me on the back of the head right this whole right this is what I so want the bride to come into the image of Jesus. Because again, the line from the author John Eldridge is that people were so compelled by Jesus that they ripped the roofs off to get close to him. And I don't see that happening out there in the institutions. We want it though. We want it for everybody. We want that dynamic going. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this group of people who are crazy enough to show up literally in every way and love on each other love on me love on you father i just ask by your spirit keep working in what you worked out there are a lot of words were released tonight there was intense things in worship father just let us hold that seed deep father and guard it against the things that will try to smother it drown it choke it out father i speak fresh life into dreams and visions here You've spoken and released that into a number of people, and it's been so painful to even hold on to that a lot of people have just set it to one side. Father, we call that back up now in Jesus' name. We call it back up. Some of you have been setting aside, and the soil has been resting. And it's time now to let the new seeds fall into that soil because the soil is rested and it's ready. Father, direct our steps. <laughs> Father, we love the bride. We love the church. But Father, we hate that stuff that we can all come in agreement with. Help us, help us, help us get free, more and more free, more and more free. Father, so many people, so well intended, so passionate for you, but we just get locked into old stuff. Set us free, set us free, set us free. Lord, we bless the church. 
And we pray for that tsunami wave of glory that was prophesied earlier to just swing up, grab everyone who is willing, float us up, and propel us forward for the glory of Jesus. Amen.